worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Revival to America, Lord, let your fire fall. Jesus, send revival across Europe, Lord, let your fire fall. We've gathered here just to lift up your name, Lord. We've gathered here for one reason, and it's not to worship man or give him glory. We've come here to praise you, Lord. Come to glorify you. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall, Jesus. Let your fire fall.
Jesus. You're worthy of praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Worship you, O oh Lord. Oh, I glorify your name, Jesus. Oh, yes, praise you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. I worship you alone because you are worthy of praise. You are worthy of praise. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Lift up your voice and praise him. Yes, Lord. Jesus, we worship you, Lord. I 
time I see you that I may see you Lord hear me oh Lord hear me when I cry Lord to
Jesus, Jesus, I love your name, Lord, Jesus, oh, yeah. we praise you, Lord, Jesus, bless your name, Lord, Jesus, nobody like you, Jesus, I love you, Lord, Jesus, bless your name, Lord, Jesus,
fast. I'm excited to be in your presence, oh Lord. Well, well, well. I don't know where you're from tonight. I'm not even looking at you. But I know you're out there. I don't know if it's your first time revival, whatever. But around here are some nights I just don't worry about too much pulling it all together because I just feel his presence. Ooh. And I'm here to glorify the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. Nobody can heal a broken spirit like Jesus. No one, no one, no one, no one in heaven or earth. Oh, the word says, I searched through heaven. I searched high and low looking for one that was worthy to open the book. And nobody, nobody, nobody but Jesus. Because he was found spotless. Oh, what a lamb, what a Lord. What a wonderful Savior you are, Lord. Oh, I praise you. Oh, I praise you. Oh, I praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My soul.
wonder you are. Yes. Get that harmonic out. You have it. My heavens. I don't know how you're still in your shoes. <laughs> I'm about to come out of my shoes up here. My heavens. Oh, Jesus, what a wonder you are. There is just nobody like you. Oh, Lord, if we're all crazy, we're going to a beautiful, insane asylum. Man, what a place. Jesus said, my father has gone to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Heard somebody talking today about getting used to God in His presence. And I just want to say to you, Lord, I'm not used to you and I never want to get used to you. When I was a little boy, I got in a lot of trouble at church because I, I've, I've been a dancer since I was five, six years old. Other kids were playing cowboys and Indians, I'd play church. But when I was a little boy, I used to sing songs, and I used to think about Jesus, and I used to remember those little pictures that I'd see in, in, in little books, and I'd see him, and I had him pictured, you know, like they had him pictured in those little books, and I would just think about looking in his eyes, and I'd just get caught up, and we'd get to singing about what it will be like when all the pain and sorrow, and as a kid, I didn't know a lot of pain and sorrow, except when my dad spanked me. <laughs> then the, first the pain came, then the sorrow came. But I was smart enough to realize that this world was not quite all it. And I used to sing, and we'd sing these songs in church, and I grew up in a pretty lively church, as you could probably figure that out. And, uh, you know, looking back, there was a lot of things that were good. There was a lot of things that weren't so good, but one of the good things was I would just dance in the presence of the Lord, and I would remember how good He had been to me, and I, I don't know, since this revival, I've been able to go back to my childhood. Yes. You see, I could sing unending songs. of how Jesus saved my soul. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I can get rid of my dignity real quick 
and dance a thousand miles because of his great love for me. Oh my. Changed my life and wiped away the past. I want to shout it out forever of top say But now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing. You changed my life and wiped away the path. I want to shout it out from every rooftop scene. Well, now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing. Sing it now, Lord, because we're happy. Oh, Lord, we're dancing now because we're free. All that we can see your face, see you smile over us. Unseen angels celebrate your joy in this place.
Yes. We love you, Lord. I want everyone standing. Everyone stand up. I really feel, you know, scripture came to my mind. I believe it's Psalm 77. I will remember the wonders of the Lord. Some of us in this room have forgotten what God's done for us. Maybe it's been, it's been a long time since you walked that sawdust trail and gave your life to Jesus. Maybe you've forgotten some of the stuff. And every once in a while, God reminds me. My wife went, and I went over to New Orleans just to uh, have dinner the other night. And, and we walked down the street and ran into transvestites, ran into runaways, and drug addicts, alcoholics. The, you could smell the alcohol everywhere and the the vomit on the sidewalks and the urine in the alleyways and you know you just and uh, people have asked me why do you you know why do you do that Steve because it's a reminder you know we love the people we're always able to help the people a lot of folks are getting saved from that area but the bottom line is it's a reminder it's a reminder where you came out of and and some of us in this room we've come out of garbage like that I'm looking over here at a girl jumping up and down what, what kind of crack habit did you have what was that how much crack did you consume a day? Uh, it got to be about $600 a day. Five, $600 a day habit. And a God's mighty delivered her. And, yeah. yeah. You know? Jesus. Whoa! We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. There's a ton of them here, but these are just some folks a little more, um, a little more, um, uh, just perfect testimonies for tonight. Sis, how, what kind of medication were you on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she said, you got an hour? This girl was on everything. As a matter of fact, correct me if I'm wrong, you spent a couple years just you spent your life in darkness really inside your house just staying on the couch with a blanket pulled over you you didn't want to go outside and um, just uh, it's a slow suicide would you would you say you're like a paranoid schizophrenic or manic depression uh, afraid to go out because she was afraid she's gonna lose control of her life her husband brought her to this revival. <laughs> Jesus! 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 Yes, Lord! And there are hundreds within the sound of my voice that lived in stale. You weren't a drug addict or an alcoholic, but you were just dead in religion. No hope. Stale, dry, lifeless. In the church, but no life. No life. But God touched you. Friend, that's as powerful as any of these other testimonies. God's touched your life. I am amazed at what God continues to do at this uh, revival and revivals that are spreading all over the, the world right now. God's on the move. Folks, there's an anointing that's changing lives. The power of God's coming down. No one is going to leave out the same. You're going to be touched tonight. But I just want everyone, just for a minute. Lindo, you remember that song, Jesus I'll Never Forget? Oh, dear. I'll try to remember. Jesus I'll Never Forget. What you've done Ghosty. for me. That song, I want us just, just for a few minutes. How many God has brought you out of some junk? Lift your hand up. It would do us good. It would do you good to think back at some of the stuff. It could, be a, it could, be a, it could have been a physical condition, uh, a sickness. It could be a, a dry spiritual time. It could be a uh, just... Uh, a hell on earth relationship that was just was wrong from the beginning. God set you free from all that. It can be a drug addiction. It can be anything, friend. But just for a minute, think of what he's brought you out of, what he's done for you. And, uh, and we'll sing this song. And I want everyone. Now, if, if you're in this place 
and you don't think God's done anything for you, friend, you're breathing. All right? He's done a lot for you. You're alive. So you can thank him just for bringing you into this world. And even if you're having a hard time now, before this night's up, things are going to change for you. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for Jesus, me. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you said. Sounds like some folks have been delivered. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's wonderful, wonderful. You know, we look at folks that have been in depression like this lady and somebody that's been in, into drugs, and we think, oh, how pitiful. But let me tell you something, friends. There is a, a bondage that's just as, as um, debilitating spiritually as anything like that, and that's the bondage of religion. And one of the things God is slowly but surely doing here is uh, he's just taking those religious uh, things off of us and releasing us into a new relationship with him. And it's absolutely marvelous. Uh, I, and Wednesday night's always a little amusing to us because we have a new crowd every Wednesday night. And many times people have just been here for the first time. And, and they, they look at what's going on here like I did when I first came in. Uh, you look at it like a calf looking at a new gate. And you wonder, what in the world? And we, we get a little amused by that because by Friday night, you see, these folks are acting just like us. <laughs> and so if you've come tonight with a hungry heart, that's all it takes. That's right. all it takes. God's just looking for a hungry heart into which he can come and demonstrate his power and demonstrate his love and demonstrate his glory and demonstrate his uh, delivering ability. And so God's in this place tonight and we welcome you here. How many of you are here for the first time? Look at this. Praise God. We welcome you. We welcome you. Where in the world y'all been? We've been here two and a half years looking for you. We're glad you came. We're glad you finally got an opportunity to come and be with us. God bless you. In a few moments, all these chairs are going to be gone. Steve's going to preach a message, and then the chairs are going to be gone. And you're going to see this area down here filled up with people on their faces crying out to God. And God's going to do some wonderful things. If you've never seen a miracle, hang around. You'll see hundreds of them in just a little bit. The greatest miracle in the world is when somebody finds forgiveness for their sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it'll happen here tonight by the hundreds, so get your heart prepared and get ready. And then we'll, after we've, uh, we've gone through that altar call, we'll have a second altar call for those of you that came and you want hands laid on you to receive a refreshing from the Lord. And we'd just be pleased if you would stay around and let us pray for you and let us bless you. 
And on behalf of our senior pastor and our church, we just welcome you here tonight. And we're so honored that you've come to be with us in this service, and we want you to be blessed. We want you to, to uh, go away refreshed. If you're a pastor and you came here and there were a bunch of problems in your church and you left those things behind, try to forget about them. Try to put them behind you while you're here. They'll be there when you get back. And there'll be some more there besides those you left by the time you get back. So if you can just lay those things aside and open your heart to God and let God just come in and do what he wants to do, you'll be tremendously blessed and refreshed. And when you go back, you'll be better capable of facing those problems. God bless you. You may be seated. So he had a lady in his church that uh, about nine years ago, she had a, a brain tumor removed, and, uh, and the right side of her body was... Um, was paralyzed as a result of that. She'd been paralyzed for all of these years, and she was in a wheelchair. And um, they brought her to the, um, uh, to the church, and, and uh, she'd been coming to church faithfully during those years, and she had a, uh, a van that, um, uh, for the handicapped that, so she could drive herself. And, uh, and uh, the power of God came into a service there, and this woman's, her right side was, was paralyzed, and the power of God came into that service, and the first thing they knew, this woman's right hand was in the air. She had not put it up there in nine years since she had that, that, that surgery. And the next thing they knew, she was out of that wheelchair. <laughs> Her face had been drawn to one side because of this uh, uh, paralysis, and it came back. And uh, she took the van that uh, she had for the, the, um, the handicapped and went and traded it in on a red convertible. <laughs> Isn't that an absolutely marvelous testimony? I'm telling you, God's moving all over this country. That church uh, has, has been down here, the pastor, and the number of people from that church has been down here. And God has powerfully touched them and uh, they're having to build a new building. Uh, Clifford told me, said, every classroom is filled to capacity on Sunday morning for Sunday school. Listen, somebody said Sunday school was dying, but it didn't die in there. Every class is filled, the, the church is filled, and uh, the power of God is coming in there with a miraculous healing like that. Friend, I believe that's just the beginning of what we're going to see. I believe it's just the beginning of what we're going to see. And uh, pastor was coming to lead some testimonies, okay? And so um, uh, God is just pouring his spirit out upon his church, folks. And I'm telling you, God wants to come to your house. He wants to come to your house of worship. And God's coming to your house of worship. In just a few moments, I believe one of the things that blocks God's uh, presence and God's coming to our house is because, and what we're seeing in this revival is we're seeing the church get saved. See, there's sin in the church. E. Stanley Jones uh, once observed, uh, and I, I, got, I got this from a, a book. He said that only about one-third of the American church knows about conversion in a vital way. And he said the other two-thirds need converting. And so if that's true, and I believe it is, and what we're seeing around the country is we, we go to, to preach meetings and, and conferences and so forth, we're seeing the church come back to God. Amen. You know, it, a, a ship, I spent 24 years in the Navy as a chaplain, and a ship is designed to float on the water. And as long as the water stays outside the hull of the ship, the ship's okay. But when the water gets into the ship, then you, you have a problem. And you see, what's happened is that the water's gotten into the old ship of Zion. And instead of us having the time and the energy to throw life preservers out there to those that are sinking in the sea of sin, we've been busy bailing water. We've been trying to keep the ship afloat. And uh, what God's doing right now is God's bailing the water. God's just getting this sin out of the church. And it is so marvelous to see. And uh, you might say, well, if, if you preach on sin, in fact, uh, there was a man from one of the European countries asked our evangelist, said, can I preach on sin uh, in my country? And Steve said, what else are you going to preach on? Yeah. But you see, sin is a, is, a, is, a, is a subject that we have studiously avoided because we didn't want to offend certain people in the church. Uh, but what's happening now is that... Um, 
that sin is being preached and those people that we were worried about being offended, they're not offended, they're convicted. And not only they're convicted, but they're coming to the altar in droves. We've had deacons come, to, come back to God right at these altars. We've had Sunday school teachers. We, we had a Sunday school teacher that had a very serious uh, pornography problem. Taught Sunday school in a church in this city, not this church, but in a city, in, in a church in this city, had a serious pornography problem, and that was, that was dealt with at this altar. And so what's happening right now is that Jesus is showing up and Jesus is being preached and sin is being confronted and the Holy Spirit is doing his work and people are getting right. And as a result, the power of God's coming back in the church. And what we just heard about is just the beginning, I believe. This is our youth pastor, Richard Crisco, and he's going to, what, you, what we're doing is we're stalling until pastor gets back. <laughs> but bail you out for a minute. But Richard's gonna bail me out. <laughs> You know what's neat is when the church gets right, the community gets right. Um, today, I had another appointment with the superintendent of schools here in Santa Rosa County with Jim May, and I was sharing with him another uh, dream that we're wanting to do in the schools and, and was putting a proposal before him. And the next thing I knew, we was just fellowshipping for about 30 minutes, and we were just having a wonderful time in the Lord. Jim May loves the Lord, and uh, he's been to some of our youth services here at the Revival. And... Um, I was sharing with him, I said, you know, uh, Mr. May, I said, this, the campuses are stronger now for Jesus than ever. He said, I've, I've been here. And, and um, what is neat is this. All of our campus clubs in our high schools are now full capacity in the classrooms. They're just standing all over the classrooms. But what, is, what to me is this so exciting is, see, three years ago when the revival hit the church, this, our young people went bananas in the campuses, and they began to birth campus ministries. There were about three, uh, two and a half years ago. We now are involved in over 30 campus ministries. Every college, junior high, high school and junior college, I mean junior high school in a three-county radius, we are actively involved in campus ministries. But what is so neat over the, last two, over the last two years is that there is a network between the churches and between the denominations that is starting to work together in our schools so that it is no longer having to be quote unquote Brownsville, but the churches are all coming together, all denominations throughout all the schools, and we're seeing a major impact. In fact, I, uh, I went to um, this, past, this past Tuesday, all of our schools are now coordinated and once a month they have what they call Seek Week. Luke 19, 10 says Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And so all the campuses together now pick out uh, a certain type of person in the school and they, they try to get them to come to campus club. For example, they'll, one month they'll, they'll zero in on the skateboarders, the next month maybe the football team, the next month you know, maybe the baseball team or basketball team, and, they, and they'll, they'll go and get little candies and, and put a little invitation, put it on their locker, you know, and invite them to the campus club. Tuesday at Escambia High School, catch this now, Tuesday at Escambia High School, they invited the cheerleaders. They had 33 cheerleaders from one school come to the campus meeting Tuesday. Is that incredible? And my friend, listen, when, when the church gets right, they're going to affect the community. And that's what I love about this generation. In fact, I have a new message that I'm preaching entitled, uh, um, unwanted, dead or alive, a message about this generation. And one of the points is uh, Generation X, I believe, is a prophetic uh, statement over this generation. If you've been here, you've heard me talk about X is the Greek word for chai, which was often used for Christo or Christ. And, um, but also X is the, the uh, mark that marks the spot of the unhidden treasure on a treasure map. But not only that, but this catch this. Just this last week, I got to thinking about X. X is also the unknown factor, catch this, the unknown factor in an algebraic expression that helps you find the solution to the problem. I like that, my friend. <laughs> Listen, this generation's not the problem. They're the solution to the problem. Hallelujah. 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 
So my friend, listen. Just as Jesus came to seek and save the lost, you are not here by, by, uh, by accident, okay? I don't know if you have planned to be here months ago or if you just today was bribed to get here or dragged here. All I know is this, that you are here tonight by divine appointment, and Jesus has come to seek and to save you. And, and listen, you've heard testimonies of how God has set free an addict, how set God set free someone in depression, how God has moved, and what God has done for others, he'll do for you tonight. He'll do for you tonight. So listen, I want to encourage you, open up your heart and let God minister to you tonight. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Pastor. Would you stand, please, everybody? I want you to take a few moments and turn around. Don't leave the building because we're going to move on quickly, but turn around and greet several people near you and welcome them tonight. Do we have a pastor's wife here by the name of Deborah Cannon? Is she here? You're Deborah? Okay, I'll be over there in just a moment. I'm going to come through the audience and we're going to get some testimonies. Now listen carefully, if you will, please. We'd like for these testimonies to be relevant to the revival, what God has done for you. I know that many of you have all kind of powerful testimonies, but we would like these to be relevant to the revival, something that God has done for you. Maybe he's touched your church, touched your life, healed your body, whatever it may be, but we're going to come through. I'm going to come through in just a moment, and we'd like to get about five or six powerful testimonies. So, Deborah, I think I'll start with you, and uh, how many do we have here tonight that would like to share a testimony quickly? Let me just hold your hand up, okay? You, okay, you want to for sure, Okay. All right. This better be good. All right. Okay. I came here. What's your name? My name is Beth, and I'm from Bigelow, Arkansas. Where? Bigelow, Arkansas. Bigelow, Arkansas. Okay. I came here on January the 3rd. In, of this year? Of this year, 1998. And I had done, I, before I came to this church, I did a big shot of crystal methamphetamine. And it was normal for me to do that. It was, I just put it out of my head. Come here, and God touched me major, and had me and looked at had me look at myself, and I was saved that night. Okay, <laughs> it was awesome. Explain, help people understand what you took. Well, what was that? Crystal methamphetamine is at speed. It's a very, very. It makes. I mean, it makes the person just zoom. You know. And I zoom anyway, naturally. And I mean, I was like a chicken with my head cut off all the time. But um, what happened to me, he, he had me look at myself, you know, and realize what a low life I was. And it was in Steve Hill's book, I can't remember the name of it, the one with Bill Clinton in it. I mean, that was, you know, that was me, you know, it, that's how he touched me. And then on January the 11th, I was at my home church and I was prayed for. And when I came to this revival, I wanted three things. Number one, to be on fire for God when I left, and I was not going to leave until that happened. Number two, to be delivered from drugs. And number three, to be delivered from my nightmares and depression. And number two and number three would follow if I had number one, and I knew that. And I got home, and on January the 11th, I was delivered from drugs. And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and then on just this, but I had a relapse. And not because I wanted the drug, but because it was there and I thought, why not? I don't want it, it's no big deal. It was because God wanted to remind me what the lies and the conniving and the deception that I had, that I went through that day when I did the drugs. He reminded me what, what excuse me, what hell it was. And, and because this has been the most peaceful, the most wonderful, the most intense, peaceful month I've ever lived in my life. And how long have you been on drugs? For 20 years. 20 years. And so uh, this has been the most peaceful month you've had in 20 years. In all my life that I How old are you? Do you mind telling us? I'm 33. So you was on drugs since 13 years old. So I was 13. And also the depression I'm I'm not depressed anymore. I am so not depressed. <laughs> I mean <laughs> <laughs> no more nightmares? No, no, no nightmares. What kind of, um, what kind of nightmares would you have? Nightmares from uh, sex demons, yeah. the most serious kind, of, uh, the most hor horrific. They were just demonic, demonically tormented. I, I truly was. I, did, I thought they were just nightmares, but no, they were true, true from the devil. 
He will not marry. So that's gone. It's totally gone. And I am being baptized here Friday night. Says, God bless you. What's your name? What's my name? Okay, my name is Beth Plunkett from Big Beth Plunkett uh -huh. from Arkansas. Arkansas. There's four of us in our group being baptized. God bless you. We'll remember you, baby. Hi. Hi. Hi, so you're a pastor's wife, and what is your name? Deborah Cannon. And where are you from? Uh, right now, we're from Etowah County in Alabama. Etowah County. I know where that is, yeah. We were from Broadwin County. Well, what's before. God done for you? Uh, two years ago this month, I think it was the 18th of January, we came. Uh, my children who had been... Two years ago? Two years ago. Um, but there's something happened last night i got to tell you about, too. Um, <laughs> my kids were coming here. Uh, Broadwin County High School was coming, and... Um, Heather, Stephanie kept saying, Mom, you got to go. I asked them to pray for her, but you got to go. Because I had a pinched nerve, the six vertebrae in my neck. And I couldn't hold my neck up. And I couldn't go to church without being on drugs. I mean, so I was, you couldn't hold your neck up? I don't know what I did to it or when I did it, but it, it got progressively worse. You were on medication yeah. for the pain? Heavy. Heavy medication. I came here drugged. <laughs> and uh, I told my husband I was tired of it because I also had a, uh, my oldest daughter was, had been rebellious and just stopped doing everything she was supposed to be doing and the way she was brought up. And that upset me more than anything. And you said for everybody to get out in the um, aisles if you had a back problem. And my husband said, well, get out there. And I said, I got a neck problem. It's not the same thing. He said, get out there. <laughs> we preachers know things, don't we? Yes, y'all do. Anyway, I stood out there and you prayed for everybody. And several ladies I know got healed instantly. And I didn't notice anything at first. And I said, God, you can heal me if you want to, but I want you to take my baby and make her whole again. How old was your baby? At that time, she was 19. So that your neck was killing you, and you was on drugs for that, but your baby was hurting you worse than the physical pain, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, the songs were singing and everything, and I, I brother, he'll call for an altar call, and I got to looking for her, and I couldn't find her. And he punched me and said, she's down there. Uh -huh. And when I, I saw her, I started crying. I got so overwhelmed. And, I, and then I realized it had been four hours since I took a pain pill, and I couldn't go with about three, and I didn't need them anymore. Wow. <laughs> wow. So I went home and called the doctor and said, skip the MRI, cancel my appointment, I'm not coming back. And he said, oh, but you don't understand. This can cripple you if you don't get it fixed. And I said, you don't understand. I don't need you anymore. God's taking care of it. <laughs> so we came every week as often as we could for the last two years until um, the Lord moved us to another church because we had tried to get the revival started at the church we were pastoring in Perdita up um, about 60 miles from here. And uh, they wouldn't accept it. And so God gave us a church. And uh, it was small and less than what we'd had, and we were concerned and everything. We went there and prayed, and got, you know, we wanted God to give us a church that would accept the revival, accept what y'all have here. And we went there, and they were old country folks, you know, and we thought, Lord, are you sure about this? And in a year's time, uh, we've gone from 59 in Sunday school to 103. Wow. In a year's time? In a year's time. Um, I take it you're in revival? Oh, I think so. Yeah. We, he hasn't preached but once or twice this month. I think wow. the Lord just takes over. Yeah. And, um, uh, what about your neck? It's, I don't have any problem with it anymore. But the important thing is for 10 years since uh, March of 88, I fell and broke my ankle. And uh, I think for three or four places, they had to pin it back together, operate on it two or three times. And I have got severe arthritis in that ankle. And... Um, when I came here last July, I felt like the Lord wanted me to inter teach interceding in our church. So we started intercessory prayer. And every Saturday afternoon, because we had it at Saturday night, I, my arthritis would be so heavy and so strong that half the time I'd have to get crutches to go to the church because I couldn't get there any other way. Or I'd have to get in the van and just drive across, across the parking lot. And I would be hurting so bad, but I knew that if I ever got in that church and started praying that it would ease up. Well, last two or three months, it's gotten so bad that it doesn't let up. Uh, Sunday night, the Lord moved miraculously in our church. They were marching around the building, and I had to sit on the pew and want it so bad to get involved. I couldn't because I hurt so bad. I just couldn't stand it. And 
I came down here last night because I wanted to see how y'all did intercessory prayer to make sure that the books and the tape and everything, I've got my mind the way it's supposed to be. And we were standing up in the, in the balcony and Brother Crisco said, Jesus didn't take those stripes just to be doing something. He paid for your healing. And if you've got a pain in your body or a problem, put your hand on it and pray as we pray around the healing banner. And so I did that, and I could feel the stiffness in my joint leave right then. And I told my husband, I said, I'm healed. He said, are you sure? I said, I know. I said, I may not know the whole total of it yet, but I know. And I could literally walk down these stairs last night frontwise like you're supposed to instead of sideways like I've been doing for the last 10 years. And all day long, I've had to remind myself, you're not crippled anymore, you can walk straight. I have to learn to walk again. All right, I saw some hands up over here a while ago. Somebody was real enthusiastic about a testimony. Let me see who that was. There was a lady over here raised her hand. Where were you at? So you can do it anyway, huh? I was supposed to uh, give this testimony several weeks ago when I didn't obey the Lord, and he's not, he's not too pleased with me about that, but I've got to share it now. Um, uh, I came down for the first time October 12th, 97, and the Lord showed me I was backslidden, and I shook. I was right over there. I shook a half an hour. I said, Lord, but how can I be? You know I love you. You know I want the mission feel so bad. He said, because you lost your first love. And my older son, bless his heart, was telling me, Mama, you're not praying like you should when you lived in Texas. You're, I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. And you're not fasting like you did, and you're not crying out for the lost. But I, I kept telling him, Son, I've got errands to do. I've got three daughters to raise. I'm a divorcee. And he said, But, Mama, I think you're just going making circles and everything. And, and I, I was really, but I didn't want to confess it. Well, God confessed it. And on the way home on the bus, he said, Linda, forget your errands and get into the Aaron Levitical priesthood. Now, I don't know what that means. I've heard it. I've read it. But I applied for school here, and, and hopefully next semester in, in August, I'll be accepted here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, come here. Hi. What is your name, and tell us where you're from. I'm Jennifer, and I moved here from Arkansas um, back in August to go to school. And I've shared my testimony with you before about how God changed my life, delivered me from drugs, and just really spared my life. Um, and today, Brother Steve, um, I was O'Neill. Today, I wanted to tell him, you know, he was you were talking about remembering the wonders of the, of the Lord. And just before we came to service, me and my roommates were just sitting around the table and just talking about what God had set us free from, you know. And I was just like, I was just so grateful and just so thankful that God has just given me a new life. You know, he's given me a new lease on life. And it's just awesome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But uh, I, uh, what I wanted to share was how God healed me. Back in September, when I remember it was when John Arnott was here, and I shared this at the school. One day when Brother Tom Zach was uh, teaching before we, before we started class, he, um, we had a time of prayer because uh, everybody was being attacked with sickness and, and stuff, and so we were praying, you know, against sickness. And, and the Lord laid it on my heart back before the break was over that I, had, I needed to share my testimony about how he had set me free from allergies and asthma. Um, I used to take shots once a week for allergies. I was allergic to anything that grew, anything and everything, all the trees, all the grasses, you name it, cats, dogs, you know, dust. And um, God totally, he healed me. And um, he, he, when John Arnott was here, the Lord told me, he, I mean, he was going around praying for people, and, and, and I know that it wasn't a man that, that healed me. It wasn't because he touched me and prayed for me and healed me. It was, the, it was God, you know, um, because several people, I mean, every time back at my home church in Arkansas, God would be moving, spirit would be moving, and he, pastor would, would say, if any of y'all need healing, come down front and get prayed for. Man, I'd be down there. I was like, I am going to get healed. You know, I know God's going to heal me. And, um, so your allergies are gone? They're gone. Wow. They're gone. I don't take any shots. Haven't had, haven't taken. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They're all gone. All gone. So you're not allergic to anything. Not, you know, no, no. <laughs> well, God bless you. How are you liking school? Oh, it's such a privilege and an honor to How be. How long have you been there now? Since August. Since August. Yeah. You found a husband yet? No, and I'm not really, not really looking. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, if there's anybody here that has a powerful testimony, let's get one or two more. You know, I sense that, um, I sense in the balcony, we don't, ever, we don't ever do that up in the balcony, but I sense there's somebody up in the balcony that you need to share a testimony that the Lord has given you. I don't know who you are. Uh, is it you? Okay, well, come on down. All right, we're going we're gonna to say it was you. All right. Let's see here. Let me look over several more people. I, got, I see a bunch of hands going up. Let me just see here who we've got. Yes, sir. Stand up here. What's your name? Uh, Grover Cross White. I'm from Statesville, North Carolina. And I have never been slain in the spirit but one time in my entire life. And I came to the revival last week. And I'm back again this week. And Wednesday night, I came a week ago Wednesday night. And it was a fellow from Oklahoma that told me, get in a prayer line. And then get in the next prayer line. Get in the next prayer line. First prayer line I got in, I hit the floor. The second prayer line I got in, I hit the floor. Third prayer line I got in, I hit the floor. Now, I take it you enjoyed that. Yes. Um, and, so and so Thursday night, which that was Wednesday night, so Thursday night, I didn't get in any prayer lines because I was tired and I had my son with me and we went to uh, Joe's house. We stay in Joe Savelli's. And then uh, Friday night I said, I'm going to get back in those lines. And Friday night, I hit the floor twice. And then I met my wife in Georgia. I live in North Carolina. I met wife, my wife in Georgia, and we went, to some, we went to a Methodist church. And then the Methodist preacher called me out, and I came up front. That lady began to pray for me, and I hit the floor again in the Methodist church. And I don't... You know, I'm, I've been in Pentecost a long time, you know, and I prayed for people and they've gotten slain in the spirit, but not me. I've always backed up and, you know, grabbed myself and all that kind of stuff. So I went home. Um, I went to another church Sunday and I went home Wednesday night and I went to my church and um, we had revival in our church Wednesday night. God's spirit moved and I began to pray for people and they began to hit the floor more than ever. And I came to a point where I came here last Wednesday and I was dry. Yeah. Are you a pastor? Yes, yes. I'm a full-time pastor and I was dry. And I just needed a touch from the Lord and I came here for that and God ministered to me. Well, Wednesday night when I went back to my church, I prayed for people and we had service until I think it was 20 minutes after 10. And I mean, I did in Wednesday night, what they did in intercessory prayer here on Tuesday nights. You know, we prayed for the lost, and we went around the room and prayed for the lost, and then, then Wednesday night, God's spirit fell and just ministered to people in my church, and I'm so thankful. What church you pastor? I pastor Cornerstone of Victory Church. It's a Pentecostal, non-denominational church. And um, so, to make a long story short, God really touched, really ministered, and I did something that I have been doing, and I want to tell the ministers here to quit this. I uh, sat down in front of the television. You know, I just went home, and I watched the news, and I'd watch a little show, and I noticed last Sunday things weren't quite like they should be. And so I want to tell you, get out from in front of the television. I didn't spend a lot of time in front of the TV. I didn't spend, I didn't spend a lot of time. I didn't go and plop down six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day because I work full time at my church. I'm full time on staff, and and um, I I just sit down and watch the news, and I just maybe watch 30, 40 more minutes, you know, maybe an hour show, like a lot of us do. And I noticed that robbed me. Yeah. It robbed me. Right. It robbed me. So, so I uh, I got uh, last Saturday. I mean, this past week, Monday or Tuesday, I said. No more television. I may watch a little bit, but not much. A little bit. And, um, but not much, because the anointing is more important than a sitcom, you know, or more important than, than the news, and more important than anything like that. So I just praise the Lord, and I, I just feel refreshed. You know, I built a church, and I spent seven or eight months working 14, 15 hours a day in labor, in the hot sun. 
and I got drained. And then I owned a Christmas tree farm and I sold Christmas trees and I got so drained that I just had to come someplace and I came here. Yeah. Well, thank God you did. Yeah, thank you, brother, for being submissive to the will of the Lord. God bless God you. God bless you. And I'm I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Hi. What is your name? And tell us where you're from. My name is uh, Helen. Helen? Uh, I'm from Pensacola. You're from Pensacola? Yes. Uh, first time I came over is, was um, November the 12th, I believe. And uh, uh, first time I came over here, I was uh, uh, standing at the balcony. And, um, what do you think about this? Uh, it's a pretty weird, you know. And it's what? <laughs> pretty weird. Yeah. Pretty weird, huh? Yes. Uh, I saw a lot of people, you know, uh, shaking and uh, lay on the floor. So I said, um, I was uh, grew up uh, in a uh, Christian family myself, so. But uh, I was a uh, uh, backslide for um, probably 20 years. Uh, and uh, the first time I come over here, and um, by the way, my husband uh, was saved here about uh, a year ago. He was saved here? Yes. He got baptized over here. That's your husband up there? Yes. Hey. Yeah. And what's his name? Uh, Alan. Alan? Yes. And uh, anyhow, I said, I asked uh, the Lord, I said, what is this, you know, and uh, um, people just uh, shaking and, you know, lay on the floor, and uh, I was so weeping so hard, you know, um, on the um, balcony. Why do you think you were weeping? I don't know, I just don't, don't have any idea, you know, I just you know, automatically just pull down rain, and, you know, and... Uh, uh, that was the Holy Spirit on you, and you didn't even know it. Yes, uh, I suppose so. so. It was pouring down rain on your face, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and uh, it, I was uh, quiet um, a whole night at the time, and, uh, you know, I don't really believe in this church, and uh, at the time, you know, that was, uh, you know, the devil worship or whatever, you know, and uh, but, you know, in three weeks, uh, you know, passed by, and uh, I was uh, sit, uh, you know, same pew, you know, second pew, we sit at the... So you kept coming uh, for about three weeks? Yes, uh, because my husband is uh, members here, so... Um, I was uh, firefighting with him. I said, I don't want to go over there no more because I'm afraid, you know, what I saw. And uh, in uh, three weeks, uh, you know, and uh, I think the uh, Lord's power is in me, you know, and I just sit on the pew and uh, suddenly my, you know, the uh, middle um, uh, uh, spinal, yes, and started shaking, you know, like this, uh, you know. So, I said, oh, Lord, I said, well, what is this, you know? And uh, I asked, uh, you know, Lord, I said, is this your spirit, and, you know? And, uh, and uh, time uh, passed by, you know, a few, few more weeks, and uh, then he shook me so hard over there, you know? Up then, uh, the more I come, every week uh, I come, you know? And uh, his power is, uh, uh, it's awesome. You know, and uh, when you were shaking, what did you think? Did you yeah, did you think God was getting a hold of you? Um, I, yes, yes, and uh, did I, you feel good. Oh, it's wonderful. It's better than anything I felt before. <laughs> and, so, uh, if anybody sees someone shaking under the power of God, it's not anything to be afraid of. Uh, no, yeah. well, uh, so you're okay now. I'm all right, yeah. and uh, uh, after that, you know, um, uh, sh um, Lord had shown me a lot of different things, and you know, I've done uh, so many big sin before, you know, before I, I born again Christian, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you did before, lo uh, God uh, still loves you, and. Uh, and uh, 
But a few months uh, passed by, you know, he delivered me from a cigarette. I've been smoking about 20 years. But, uh, you know, um, I tried to quit, uh, you know, many times. You know, with our own powers, we cannot do it. You know, by, by Lord, you know, he can do anything for us, you know. Um, Let me ask you, uh, <laughs> where are you from? Uh, original, I'm from um, Taiwan. From Taiwan? Yes. And uh, after that, you know, Law, um, he showed me the holy lover. He showed me the, um, uh, the weeper. Uh, uh, also, uh, the uh, second time uh, he done to my life was uh, he healed. After I, I gave my boss, uh, my, my little boy, he's almost five years old right now. And uh, after, uh, uh, he born about seven months, you know, my necks and uh, are very, very stiff and always in a heavy pain. And uh, I was a real sick also, you know, the doctor, you know, I went to a different hospital and uh, the doctor um, told me nothing wrong with you except uh, they took an x-ray of uh, my throat, you know, and uh, uh, he said, I have a, a reflex uh, problem, which is, uh, uh, you know, yes. digest. Yes. Uh -huh. I thought that I was all going to uh, die. I think yeah, that's uh, uh, the devil one, try to destroy my soul, but... Uh, uh, but the Lord healed you. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, the uh, Lord just uh, began to shake my head, the force, you, you know, which is, uh, you know... The body shook first, uh, then the, my, my head started shaking. Then I realized my, my neck pain's gone. It's a relief, you know. And uh, so, uh, I was uh, took a medication for the uh, reflux problem for many years. And uh, then after that, you know, I guess, I suppose, uh, you know, the uh, body shaking, I think the Lord is cleansing uh, heal me at the time, so I didn't even know it. But uh, after a few months uh, passed by, uh, I, you know, I feel, you know, I can, I can eat anything. And I go to sleep, and just like a little baby. And uh, uh, I want to thank you, Jesus, for uh, everything uh, he done to my life. So you, let me just say this. It took, it took a while though, didn't it, for you to get, to, to be, to get in. It took a while. It took a while for you to keep from being scared and to open up, didn't it? Yes. What would you say to somebody here like that tonight that might be looking at all this and saying, nah, I don't know? Um, I tell you what, God is awesome and uh, he's a powerful and uh, he's a real. Because, yes. And, uh, um, Did you ever dream that God could touch you like that? Uh, no. I never dream about. I was uh, back, uh, back in, uh a year ago. Now you know he really transformed me another person in the praise law, and he also changed my my husband's life, and he also transformed from uh, you know a little bit a year ago, and. Uh, you know God can really use you. Uh, thank you. God can really use you. No telling what he'll do for you if he's touched you like that. He's going to use you. Open up and let him use you. Start witnessing. Start telling people what he's done for you. Yeah, I, I do, you know, I, I do witness uh, uh, every day, you know, for the law because uh, I work at a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant. I uh, met a lot of different uh, people there. Even uh, one, one time, I think a law uh, brought uh, one bus of, uh, you know, the... Um, the guests from uh, uh, different states and they come to revival, and the Lord just uh, brought the bus into the you know uh, restaurant. So I able to talk to them and uh, ministry to them a little bit. And uh, you cook good Chinese food. Uh, me, yeah. uh, if, uh, real Chinese. Food. Where do you work? Uh, Hunan Garden. Huh? Hunan Garden. Hunan Garden. Yes. I'm coming to see you. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank God bless you.
Sovereign Lord is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because He has anointed you to preach good news. Has sent you to the poor to bind up the broken hearted to bring freedom to the captive and release the ones in darkness all oh, this is of the favor of the Lord. It's the day of His glory. Of the favor of the Lord. The day of His vengeance. to the poor this is the year. with the power of his word to bind up the broken hearted you can bring freedom to the captain this is the year. and release the ones in darkness this is the year this is the year
God is an awesome God. I feel the Lord is um, changing the direction of this service. He's not really changing the direction. It's just the direction he was going in to begin with. It's always a change for us. It's a change for the ministers. It's a change for the evangelist. When, um, when you feel prepared to go one direction and he wants to go another, which is, that's not called missing God. That's called being yielded to the Holy Spirit. And... Um, People, people ask me all the time, do you, what kind of pressure are you under? Everyone standing, please. They uh, ask what kind of pressure are you under having to preach night after night and Lindell, you know, having to sing night after night. We're not under pressure. This is not a, uh, an entertainment type of thing. This is, you know, we have some of the greatest Bible teachers in the world come here. Superintendents of, of major denominations come, evangelists. Uh, we have senators and congressmen come to this place. We've had, we've had a kind of hierarchy come here, people that are well-respected. And, and, you know, they'll, they'll come in. We have multimillionaires. We've had billionaires come here. We have street poor people. It's none of that matters. It's not like, you know, when someone comes, you try to impress them. Because God is the only one here that I pay attention to when it comes to that. <laughs> See, he knows. He knows everybody here. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going to go through. He knows where you've been. He knows your yesterdays and tomorrows. And so uh, uh, we're not here to make everybody happy, to make everyone, you know, to, to tickle everyone's ear. Someone asked me that question when you're preparing a message. You know, do you try to cover everybody in the message? No. Uh -uh. Holy Spirit covers everyone in the message. And, um, uh, and he knows how to get a hold of people. And I've also learned through time that everyone's basically the same. You can be wealthy, you can be poor, but we all have the same problems. We go through the same struggles, and we're all born the same and we die the same. So I want us to pray tonight. I want us to pray and we're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, change our lives. If you are in this place tonight and uh, maybe at home you're listening to this or at your in your automobile, and you're away from God, you're backslidden. Sister from, um, is it Thailand, Taiwan? That was a beautiful, pure testimony. I love that. I love the broken English. You speak good English, by the way. But I love you having to search for words. I love some of the words that you've learned about God, awesome. That's a good word. And I love, I love the fact that you shared with us that you were backslidden, had a smoking problem, you did a lot of sin, raised in a church, a Christian family, but you were in sin. We've heard that so much, and you may be here right now, and maybe you were offended by this brother talking about television, but that's your very problem. It, it, it bothers you to hear about it, uh, but this is a very confrontational meeting. Every meeting here is very confrontational. There will be no change in anyone's life until we're confronted. Those of you here that believe your spiritual life is intact, everything's wonderful, you are in dangerous territory. You are in dangerous territory when everything is just fine and dandy. You know, I know who I am, I know where I'm going, I've learned the Word, and that is a scary place to live. God 
can jerk the rug out from under you, just like he allowed Job to be tested to the max. God can allow that to happen in your life to see where you stand. To see where you stand. That's a shaky place. I spoke the other night on it. But I want everyone in this place, whether you're spiritually strong or spiritually weak, I want you to pray this prayer. Everyone's going to ask the Lord to speak through their hearts and to change their lives. And if you are spiritually strong here, and, um, but your shadow is not healing the sick, then I would encourage you to go after God. There might be more. There might be more. See, I don't compare myself with the Demases in the Bible. Demas was a man who backslid and, and he um, loved this present world and uh, Paul was disappointed in him. He left Paul's, the ministry of Paul and went off to the world. And uh, I don't compare myself with people like Demas. Many Christians would. They compare themselves with the other people in the church that are worse than they are. If you'll look at Jesus, you compare yourself with Jesus. Or pick some people in the Bible that were on fire for God all the time. You'll fall short. And those are the people that you need to look at and say, Jesus, do I have the tenacity of the Apostle Paul? When I'm shipwrecked, will I praise you? When I'm being beaten, will I praise you? When things are good, when things are bad, will I praise you? Everyone here, pray with me right now. Everyone within the sound of my voice, I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, the Lord spoke to me about someone uh, that is going through a severe trial. This is not a prophetic word. It's, it's easy to stand in front of thousands of people and say somebody's going through a trial. Okay? But this may be you, so listen. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, the Lord spoke to me. My message was already prepared. I was getting ready for tonight's service. I was kneeling by my bed, and the Lord spoke to me about somebody here. You're going through a severe trial. You're here tonight out of desperation. Part of you feels like giving up hope, but there still remains a small reserved area of your spiritual man that wants to cling on. And you want to weather this trial, regardless of how difficult life becomes. The Lord is speaking to you tonight. Do not look at this season in your life as something unusual. He experienced far more. I'm going to say that again. Do not look at this season or this trial in your life as something unusual. Jesus experienced far more. The testing of your faith produces, produces patience. You are experiencing extreme conditions now in order to be relaxed in him later. I'll say that again. You are experiencing extreme conditions now in order to be relaxed in him later. You will understand later on. Sometimes the Lord has to stretch us before we realize how much he really has a hold of us. We trust him. He's making you. The Lord would say unto you, be still. Don't complain. Don't squirm. And please don't say it's not fair. I am with you, says the Lord. The day is the darkest before the dawn. Don't be rash in your behavior. You will regret your actions later. I'm going to say that again. Don't be rash in your behavior. If you're going through a serious trial, you will regret your actions later. The Lord would say, I have created you. I have a plan. Let me have my way. You will one day say, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in my eyes. So whoever that's for, I don't know who you are, and I don't want your hands raised. Just take it from Jesus. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. I'm going to pull a statement. I stepped out just for a minute, and I knew the Lord was turning this whole thing tonight. That was, it's a quote from Jesus at the conclusion of talking to the rich young ruler. 
And the Lord was talking how hard it was for the rich to get into the kingdom. The disciples were, and the Lord said, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I see it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And the disciples were discouraged. They were astonished that he would say something like this. And then they said, Well, who can be saved? And Jesus made this statement. And I'm going to use it in a very open text, textual way tonight. We're going, to, we're going to lay it out in front of everyone. And this covers anything. Say with me, anything. Anything you're going through. Any problem. Any disaster in your life. Anything that the man and man has come up to you and said, Sis, you are going to be consumed with this situation the rest of your life. This covers everything Jesus said to his disciples. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. I want to say that again. Now, I've got a 15-page message here that I'm not using. The Lord is going a different direction. This is no notes. This is from the heart. With men, this is impossible. Jesus understands that. He understands we, we cannot conceive of a five or $600 a day crack habit being delivered. We can't conceive that, friend. Do you know what it's like? And I'm not going to share your whole story, sister. I'm going to share a general story of crack addiction. Do you know what it's like to wake up and the only thing that's on your mind is a drug? It motivates you. It consumes you. You get up, you shower, you go straight out the door, you'll turn tricks, you'll sell your mother's television set, you'll do whatever you have to do to get one more crack cocaine hit. That's crack. Methamphetamine is just as bad. It's sweeping this nation right now. And folks that are on methamphetamine will tell you it is one hellish drug to come off of. They're consumed with it. Your mind does move 5,000 miles an hour. You feel like you're the king of the road. You can do anything. You can tackle any problem that comes your way, but it's all a lie, ain't it, sis? It's all a lie from the devil himself. He knows methamphetamine will destroy. It'll kill the youth of America, and it's rampant right now. So is heroin. And coming off of it, as a matter of fact, when you're on it, you think you can come off of it. When you're on it, there it comes again, that lie from the pits of hell. I can kick this thing anytime I want to. You know what I think I'm going to do? You'll be high on meth. You know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to, next, next August, I'm going to go to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. I'm going to do this. But the devil will come to you and say, you can do anything. Man will come up to you and lie to you and say, you'll never come off crack cocaine. You'll never do this. You'll never do that. You'll never be able to come free from methamphetamine. While you're high, the lies will come to you. And when you're down, the lies will come to you. Man will come to you and say, it's all impossible. Richard, as you were sharing about the youth, just think of this, friend. Before this revival broke out, how many youth clubs were in our schools? Three. How many youth clubs do we have now? Over 30. That That is impossible. I know because I work with young people I have all my life. That's impossible. You can't entertain them enough to do that, friend. I don't care if you have socials every single morning to get them there. They ain't coming. They're not going to crawl out of bed. They're not going to come to the Bible study. They're not going to come worship God before school. They're not going to come and stand around the telephone pole and let all their friends see it. Those things are impossible. And if you had said to Richard Crisco back in 1994 that it's going to happen around 1995, it's going to explode, he would have looked at you and said, well, I hope so. But I just really can't imagine that just sort of happening. Those things that are impossible. Let me ask you something, friend. What on earth are you going through? Pastor, what are you going through? What's the situation at your church? How bad is it? Do you have an anarchy on your, on, your, on your table? Do you have a Judas in your ministry? Is your board rising up against you? Are they having little socials without you? Everybody invited but the head honcho? Are they talking about you behind the back? What's going on? What is impossible? What is that situation you're going through? I want you to think about it right now. Some of you come with some serious problems, and you're hoping right here 
This is where it's going to happen. God's going to touch me here. I'm telling you, he is going to touch you here, friend. But you're going to start focusing. You're going to start focusing on the other one. The one who sees it from above. The one who's the Alpha and Omega. The one who can see your little church going into a big church. The one who can see your unsaved loved one going into, the, going into the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. The one, and I don't know how you pray for folks, but when I pray for people, heathen, I pray for my brother George for 20 years like this. I went, Jesus, save his soul. Then he'd call me up. He said, Steve, I got a job with the Grateful Dead. And I go, dear God, save his soul, save his soul, save his soul. He'd get worse and worse. But I'd always see my brother George with his hands lifted up. Yeah. I'd say, Jesus, you said that it's impossible with man, but with you all things are possible. And I see through your eyes, Jesus, I see my brother worshiping God. He's going after God. He's on his knees and he's praying. He's seeking the Lord. I see my brother saved. And those of you that have been in this revival for the last few weeks, right over there, my brother's been here three or four times already. He's going after God. He wants to go into the ministry. He's been saved. He's on fire for God. Impossible. Just remember, Pastor, every individual that's in that church, every single one of them, God's the one to breathe life into them. God can touch them. God can minister to them. One of the things that I love about this revival is the anointing. The anointing. Pastors, you're going to get back to your church and the power is going to flow. And it'll flow and it'll flow and it'll flow. This brother testified that people were on the floor. You want to know why I didn't get real theological with you, friend? Because it's not a real theological thing right now. It's called people are on the floor. Leave it like that. Don't get so deep. That ain't that deep. It's surface. It's right on the floor. They're lying there. What's happening? Well, first of all, that's Uncle Joe. He's never done anything like that before. And people are standing around just looking at him, wondering when he's going to move. Who's Uncle Joe? Well, he's a cantankerous old hillbilly in the church. He cusses when he's home. He barely makes it into the church on time, and he stinks. He never takes a bath. Now he's in the church, and he's laying on the floor. Next thing you know, Joe's coming to church with a tie on. He's all dressed up. He's worshiping God. What happened? God touched Uncle Joe right there on the floor. Impossible. That's Jesus' business. He can work in that type of situation. He can take somebody that you know, that you know, that you know will never change. That Judas in your church, the one who is always messing with your pastor, he could be your right-hand man. He could turn around in a heartbeat. Whew. Whew. Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. I love this statement, friend. You know, this is one of those statements. Who was it, Pastor? Uh, Mark Twain. He said, it's not those, script those scriptures in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's those that I do understand that bother me. This is one of those that I do understand. You can't cut, no matter how you cut this pie, it's going to come out like this. It says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You can just take half of it. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Oh, so with God, some things are possible. No, friend, with God, all things are possible. With God, my healing's possible? I believe so. I believe the Lord shared with us a few testimonies tonight that are, that are, that are interesting. Would you say they're interesting? They're interesting. God, these are impossible things, and people try their very best to share what kind of pain they've gone through, but no one can do that. You're never going to relate to that, friend, unless you're arthritic tonight and you can't walk, you can't move around. You're not going to understand what people are talking about. You're not going to understand this dear woman, the pain, the suffering, what she's been through. Unless you've hacked on a three packs of cigarettes a day for the last 15, 20 years, you're not going to know what it means to be delivered from smoking. And she didn't talk about Nicopatch. Nicoderm, she didn't talk about chewing gum. She talked about Jesus. Something that happened in this place that changed her life. God's just trying to lay a foundation for this week. I can tell that right now, friend. So you're here tonight. You're backslidden. And you cannot imagine ever being restored back into fellowship with Jesus. 
You can't imagine it. You were once on fire for God, but you slipped away from him. And you can't imagine being back in that. Joy has been gone for years. Peace has been gone for years. Happiness, the, 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 the presence of the Spirit in your life. You're backslidden. You can't imagine being restored. You need to chew this scripture up, friend. To you, that's impossible. I don't believe God will ever forgive me. That's man. I don't think he'll ever wash me clean. That's man. That's man speaking to you. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. The, the devil himself and your mind is saying, I'll never come out of this backslidden condition. I've been in church. I know the Bible. I've done this. I've done that. I'm, I'll just never come back. Friends, stop where you're at. Just stop where you're at. Stop it right there and take this scripture and just pound this. Pound this in your head. Pound it over to the devil's head. With God, all things are possible. 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 There's nothing I'm going through that he can't fix. There's nothing I've ever been through that God can't fix. There's no sickness. There's no healing. There's nothing. There's nothing that God can't take care of. There's nobody in my family that God can't save. There's not a lost loved one that God can't save. Shut up. There's nobody that God can't hit. There's nobody that God can't touch. You really believe that? Yes, I do. There may be a missionary here working. I'm just sharing from my heart, friend. There may be a missionary here that's working with the Muslim nation. You're discouraged because you're not seeing a lot of people saved. Let me tell you what's going to change the Muslim, the Muslim nation. The power the power the power read the New Testament read the book of Acts I believe I don't know where the scripture is help me out somebody Bob Phillips maybe you know where it's at when Peter was preaching and the power just came down they were all filled with the Holy Ghost Cornelius's house the power just comes in they were accustomed to visitations of the Holy Ghost the power just came down in the middle of his message the power comes down that's what we're watching here friend. the power comes down We've had Muslims, we've had Muslims come in this place, non-believers, but they believe, man, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when your strength goes out of your legs and you hit the ground under the power, it'll take a Saul of Tarsus, make a Paul out of them. It'll take a non-believing Muslim, next thing you know, they're going to be baptized in that pool up there. We've seen it with our own eyes. We've seen Buddhists saved in this place by the power of God. Tonight, we've got a Buddhist in this place that was saved. Matter of fact, she stood up in this baptismal pool and she said, Buddha never did anything for me. Jesus done everything for me. No more Buddha. There you are right there. Glory. What's going on, friend? What's, that's impossible. That's impossible. It's impossible for a Muslim to come to the Lord. It's impossible for the indoctrination that they've gone through for years and years and years and years and years for them to be changed. I've got a cousin who's at the Revival School of Ministry right now who was two and a half, three years in the Jehovah's Witness Bible College going after Jehovah, going after that cult. And they taught him, spent most of the classes on teaching him how to combat Christians. When I heard he was in that school, I thought, dear God, he's gone forever. He was a drug addict, and now he's in that school. It's over. This was years ago. Impossible situation, friend. And when you're, when you're in a cult for a few days, that's one thing. A few weeks, another. A few months, another thing. But when you go to their Bible school, all right, and you're like three years into it, something's going on. That's serious indoctrination. That's enough time for a lot of professors to get around your ear and convince you of every one of your doubts and talk to you and, and, and just lead you down that wicked path. Impossible that a few months ago, I'm on the phone with him. I said, Brian, why don't you come on up to the revival? He's living in South Florida. Comes up here, sits right over there, he and his girlfriend power of God comes down. He gets to his hotel room. They're in separate rooms. 
He gets to his hotel room. He calls me up. He says, I got to talk to you, Steve. I said, I don't want to talk to you. I don't, we don't need to talk, Brian. He goes, I'll tell you what's happened. I got to tell you what's happened. I said, I know what's happened. He goes, we got to talk. You got to come over here and talk, man. I said, no, I don't need to talk. You need to let it go in you. You need to let God do this. We don't need to talk. You need to let God do this. He, and he said, Steve, everything's changing right now. Everything's changing all around me right now. Everything's changing. Now, wait a minute. That's impossible. That's impossible, friend. One service at Brownsville? Come on. Give me a break. Alcoholic for 23 years. This guy was a mess. You telling me in a prayer, God's turning him around? Those things that are impossible. Some of your faith is beginning to rise. I can feel it. Those things that are impossible with man are possible with God. You want to know how simple things are with Jesus sometimes? You can live a sinful life. This is for somebody in this place. You can live a horrible, sinful life. Wicked, wicked life. And not deserve for the Lord to give you the time of day You've been so wicked. But there was a man like that, and one day he found himself hanging next to Jesus. This is impossible, man. Being crucified, probably naked, just like Jesus, hanging next to Jesus. And he looks over at him. According to the Word of God, he had already cussed the Lord. The Bible said he had cursed him. Both, both those thieves had been mocking Jesus, mocking, making fun of him. And then I believe, you know, Jesus sitting there taking it, just, just taking it from down there and from side to side. Jesus just hanging there. Then Jesus says something like this. I believe this is when the turnaround came. He goes, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I believe the thief heard that. You'll see, you'll see where Matthew, I believe it's Matthew, talks about both of them mocking Jesus, and then Luke records one of them turning and said to Jesus, said to the other thief, we're deserving of our punishment, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he looks at Jesus. I'm talking about an impossibility, friend. This, thing, this kind of stuff doesn't happen. He said, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. You know what man would have said? You scuss. Remember you. You just cursed me. You deserve to hang on that tree till you, your guts spill out. You curse me, you mock me. That's man right there. Jesus looks over and says, hey, Today, you're going to be with me in paradise. That's the kind of Savior I'm presenting to you tonight, friend. He's a miracle worker. You can be as wicked as wicked could be in this place. He'll forgive you. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. And if you died tomorrow, you'd go up and be with him forever. What a Savior. That's impossible. That's crazy. So what are you going through? What's the difficulty that you're facing? I remember when the Lord touched my life mightily back in the turn of 1995. I was dry. I was thirsty. Just came out of the Argentine revival. Was planting churches in several areas of the world, but I was running on empty. Anybody ever run on empty? If you had told me, if you had told me that I could go somewhere and get a prayer and it would change everything, I would have said, you know, have, send the prayer in a, an envelope or something. Just send it to me, you know. If you had told me that, you know, that a prayer is going to change things, that's crazy. How many have been prayed for a ton of times in your life? How many have been prayed for and nothing really that you know of happened? Be honest. How many have you prayed for by somebody and nothing really happened that much that you know, you know of? Most everybody in this place. If you would have told me that somebody was going to pray for me and my whole life was going to change, I would have said that's 
That's impossible. It just doesn't happen like that. God's more, he's heavier than that. <laughs> you got to earn it. You got to work for it. He just doesn't give it to you like that. You got to struggle with it. No, it's really a lot simpler than that, Steve. If you just get prayer, he'll change you. And in London, boy, somebody needs to hear this. I remember it was a horrible day. It was raining cats and dogs. And back in January of 95, I was on my way back from Russia. I went through London to buy some old books and visit a church that where God was moving. And only had a few hours left and I wanted to go buy my wife a whistling teapot before I went to the church. They sell teapots in London that whistle in harmony. If you ain't never heard one, you ain't got a teapot. <laughs> These teapots whistle in three-part, four-part harmony. They're awesome. They are awesome. And I wanted one of those teapots. So I went all over London looking for the teapot and finally found one. Put it in the bag, raced over to the church, soaking wet, nasty, nasty. Walked into the church and there's 500 bodies all over the place. Englishmen, Englishmen. Some of them were jerking, but most of them were just moaning and groaning. And I was soaking wet. I had the teapot under my arm. I stepped over the bodies. This is impossible, friend. This is crazy. This is like, you know, things like this don't happen. And I walked up to the pastor and I said, we got an appointment. He goes, oh my goodness. He goes, look what's happened in my church again. It was a three o'clock in the afternoon appointment and the church was full of bodies. And I said, I don't need to talk to you. I was soaking wet. I had my teapot. I was finished. I said, just pray for me. That's crazy, friend. You know, first of all, you'll put on a suit, you know, you get all cleaned up, you dry your hair, you don't look like a, you crawled out of the mud. You know, you just, you just don't do things like that. And, uh, and me being from, a, you know, from Pentecostal churches, this was an Anglican church. And, you know, I wanted someone to go, in the name of Jesus, touch it. See, I don't care how people slap me and knock me around. I've been around that, you know. <laughs> Spit on you. Just pray for me. You know. <laughs> but he didn't. He comes up and he goes. Just like our prayer team, you know. He goes, Jesus, touch my brother. Give him more of your spirit. Friend, 20 minutes later, <laughs> I woke up. I woke up. I went, Jesus, this is impossible. This is impossible. I was brand new. I'm talking about brand new. I was so brand new. I got up and went, and I ran around the place looking for prayer tags. I wanted more people to go, Jesus. <laughs> touch him. Just touch him. <laughs> and I did, and it happened again. I got up, and I'd been through the Argentine revival, friend, for 10 years, been under that stuff. You know, that powerful move of God, the shaking, the fall, and all that kind of stuff we've seen for years. But this was me. Did you hear me? This was that impossible thing. This was a man who was raised differently. This was a man that had the mind to plant churches, the ability to plant churches, the wisdom to plant churches. This is the one who had some successes under his belt. I didn't need all that kind of stuff. But the power came in. Now remember, leaving. Is anybody listening tonight? Yeah. Folks, this is custom made for Wednesday night, trust me. Because this was impossible. 
I remember I got up, got in the car, and I was like a kid. Just brand new kid. I was just looking for anyone to pray for. Got on the airplane, heading, heading that, that plane, Austrian Airlines, heading back to America. And I'm sitting on the plane, and I'm going, I got to pray for somebody. I got to pray for somebody. I got to pray for somebody. And I turned to my friend, and I said, I'm going to go pray for the pilot. He goes, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. How many know what I'm talking about? How many is like? I'm going nuts. And I get, off of the, I get off of the airport, and I call my wife. I go, Jerry, everything's changed. You know, I've been on a mission trip all my life, man. I was like, nothing changes. It's all the same, you know. Everything's changed. I'm coming home, baby. Looking forward to seeing you, Steve. No, I'm coming home. I'm going to pray for you, honey. Like, like, who cares? All right. Come on, pray for me. We'll go to sleep, you know. And she picks me up at the airport and in the car. I'm going, when we get home, I'll pray for you. I'm going to pray for you when we get home. Everything's changed, Sherry. Everything's changed, man. My whole life has changed. This woman's been with me like 16 years. This is impossible. And I share with her what's happened in my life, how God's changed me. And you know what it's like talking to folks that just don't believe. You know, they can see it, but it's like, hello, you know. I said, when we get home, I'm going to pray for you, and God's going to touch you. And uh, she said, Steve, it's late. Can we do this? Can he touch me tomorrow morning? So I said, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so the next morning, she gets up, and I'm up early, man, because, you know, I don't want this, whatever it is, to leave. You know, so you're up early to make sure it's still there. <laughs> you're walking around the house going, you know, and sometimes you don't feel like the presence of God's with you, but he's still there, friend. My wife gets up. She gets all dressed, and she comes into my study, and it's like she just doesn't want to get it. She doesn't want to come into my study. She's already heard me the day before. You know, everything's going to change. Your whole life is going to change. She walks in. She goes, Steve, I don't want you to be disappointed. That's what she says to me. I don't want you to be disappointed. When you pray for me, nothing's going to happen. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This was B.C. before Cooley, okay? This is before music and all that kind of stuff. It was, just, it was just me and Jerry in my study. No soft vineyard music in the background, just us, okay? I said, Jerry, I'm going to lay my hands on you. Like, <laughs> she's standing there in her Sunday best, and she said, nothing's going to happen, Steve. You know, when you're married that long, you can talk like that. You know, like, I love you, honey. We're, we're married for life. We're, I love you dearly. But, you know, this is not going to happen. And I remember I reached over. I got close to her forehead. And she let out two words. Dear Jesus! <laughs> when who way? And then my little boy Ryan and my little girl Shelby, he didn't know piddly, they didn't know nothing, friend. You hearing me? None of this pre-stuff like, we're going to pray for you and this is what's going to happen. You know, there's all these prayer teams working at the church and all this is going to be happening. No, they knew nothing. I said, Ryan, get in here. Get in here. Just get in here. <laughs> Stand up right there. <laughs> Jesus, do it again. Yeah. Wham! <laughs> Out cold for 30 minutes. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. Little Shelby, wham, under the power of God. You say, well, what's happening? Something is changing inside. The presence of God is coming into people. They're sensing the nearness of Jesus. This wasn't born yesterday, friend. God's been on the move for a while. But he's trying to get his church in focus. He's trying to pull us in focus. He's trying to get us all together, looking in the same direction. 
And that's what he's up to, and it's happening all over the world. We have people here from all over the world tonight. Tomorrow night, more are coming in from all over the world. What's going on here, pastor, is impossible. This revival is impossible. The largest church revival in the history of America. That's what it is already. By the end of this year, it'll be the longest revival in the history of America. That's impossible. That's impossible. I don't care how good Lyndall Cooley is. I'm a mediocre preacher. It doesn't matter how good the preaching is or the singing is. People don't come. They're not going to come from around the world to hear somebody sing a song and somebody preach a message. Think about that. This is impossible. I already have newspapers wanting to, they're making reservations to come in and handle the third anniversary of the revival. Want to do full page spreads because they know it's history in the making. And most of them, when they call, they'll say, Reverend, is it still going on? I go, yeah, it's unreal. They're coming from all over the world. It's amazing. People are so hungry. So I'm still amazed by it, friend. But it's all impossible. Got a letter the other day from a heroin addict that was here, right here. Prayed for him. He pulled up his arm and he had holes in his arm, tracks. But these were welts. These were deep holes. Serious methadone heroin addict. Just got a letter from him. He's been delivered. Been delivered right here. That's impossible. That's impossible. Want to know what else is impossible? Marriages are healed. That's impossible. That's crazy. 21 years married, fighting for the last 10, at the brink of divorce. They make it to the revival. They come down to the altar, get right with God. Some of you are going to do that in just a few minutes. You're going to get right with God because that's the problem with your marriage. You're going to get right with God down here. You're going to be prayed for. And sir, you're going to go from being a bear at home to a little puppy. You're going to be a joy to be around. You're going to be a blessing rather than a curse. Things are going to change. Young people, some of you are going to come down here. We're going to pray for you tonight. And you're going to turn from a little cantankerous pain to be with, one who doesn't ever want to talk to her mother. You always fight with your mom. You're going to change suddenly. And your mom is not going to believe it. You're going to want to go shopping and hang out with your mom and, and just talk with your mom and be with your mom. What happened? The power came down. And that's impossible. That's impossible, friend. Trying to encourage everyone here tonight, no matter what you're going through, I think God's allowing this evangelist to be geared up for this upcoming, this year. Because see, I'm believing God for the impossible. I don't know how big your vision is. I don't know what you're thinking, friend. But I've shared before in this place, I love this revival. And within the next few months, you'll see this place, there won't be room anywhere on this campus for people. They're coming by bus loads. We know that for a fact. They already call ahead of time. Spring break is like a month away, and they start pouring in here, and it's just nonstop from then to the end of summer. I love that. It's wonderful. I love thousands of people. But that's nothing. You know what God could do? He could do the impossible. Oh, yeah, they can come in in buses, and some of you here in buses and vans. But you know what he could do? He could just, rather than people have to get into vehicles, God could just come down. He could come down in Pensacola proper in this city while we're worshiping in this place. The power of God could break through the heavens and fall all over the city, everywhere, in the schools, in the cafeterias, in the restaurants, at the ball games, everywhere his power could come down. It's 
See, some of these people that are screaming, they believe it. See, I'm looking for the night that the police pull up out there with sirens. And they come running in. And I'm speaking this into your ears, Jesus. They come running in. And they don't care about the service because it's chaos outside. It looks like the rapture just took place. Cars are pulled over on the side of the road. Restaurants, people are laying all over the floors of restaurants. Do it! Do it! Do it, Jesus! Do it! Come down! Come down! Come down! Come down! That's impossible! How small is your God, friend? It can happen in a heartbeat. See, we're dealing with a nation that 94% of them have a Bible in their homes. 84% of them believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 80% believe that they'll stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for their sins. We're dealing with a nation that has heard the gospel. So why couldn't God suddenly bring an overwhelming dread on everyone where they fall to, you know what I'm talking about, suddenly there's just a vacuum inside and you're sitting at the table in the restaurant you're going, honey my God, look at our condition. When was the last time we even thought about Jesus, honey? And she starts crying, and you start crying, and and you fall on your face right there at the table of the restaurant. Friend, it can happen just like that. It's happened, by the way, in church history. That's why I love the great revivals of years gone by. You read about them, and all I do, when I read those books, I say, Jesus, do it again. Do it again. Come down. Come down in power. So what what kind of situation are you going through, friend? Pastor, these testimonies tonight blessed my soul. I love ordinary people sharing about an extraordinary God. You know, just, you know, it's just, you know, it's like peanut butter and jelly. It's just so plain, plain people sharing how God changed their lives. But here's what we're going to have to do. Tonight, before we go any further in this service, before we pray for anybody, there needs to be mass repentance. I say mass, hundreds and hundreds are going to repent because hundreds and hundreds are away from God in this place. So you can be religious and not know God. You know that. You can, you can go to hell with a choir robe on. So you can be singing in the Brownsville choir and go to hell. When, you, when the rapture takes place, you can still be sitting there. See, nobody knows another person. You can look good, but God knows. God knows what you're going through. A few nights ago, I played a tape by Billy Graham here in the revival I was talking about how God has been trying to get a hold of us And I brought to remembrance in 1962 when I was in Huntsville, Alabama at Redstone Arsenal, Billy Graham came by. I was only eight years old. And I played a tape of Billy Graham preaching. And he was hitting the nail on the head. This is what he said on that tape. He said, oh, you can go to church. You can sit on the front row. But God knows what's inside your heart. Heavy-duty stuff, friend. Nothing's changed. It's the same now as when Billy preached back in 62, 72, 82, 92. It's all the same. It's the same back in Jesus' day. He said, you whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Outwardly you look good, but inwardly there's dirt, there's junk. Now, a bunch of you, I just saw a bunch of folks in this place. Turn your head from me. Don't be upset at me. Everybody look this way. Don't get upset. 
get right. Don't get upset. Don't get upset. Getting upset is not a solution. Saying, sitting there and going, who does he think he is talking to us about sin? I'll tell you who I think I am. First of all, I'm a man that God has placed in the ministry. Number two, I've got the position right now at this time in history to stand behind this sacred pulpit and preach his word, which I don't take lightly. Number three, I am holy. I'm not living an ungodly life. I live a good life. I live for Jesus. There's not secret sin. I'm living a holy life. When those ingredients are there, and I know Jesus, and I've spoken with him today. I've been with him all day long. When those ingredients are all there, friend, by the way, those of you that are turned off with evangelists, there's a lot, there's millions of people out there that are on fire for God. They're not in sin. They're not in sin. They're living for God. There's a lot of ministers out there that are holy as, they, holy as can be. They love God with all their heart. Don't get turned off just because a few of them rise to the surface and the heat comes up and they go off like dross. There's some good people out there. The Bible says, how are they going to know unless somebody tells them? So I'm telling you tonight, it's a call of a minister. Someone once said that an evangelist, his job is to make people feel rotten and then make them feel good again. So first you've got to feel rotten. You've got to know if something's going on inside your heart. And then it's like a doctor that comes up to a patient and he looks at him and says, you know, are you hurt? And you go, yeah, and he starts poking you until he finds the problem. And you scream out. Then he said, aha, there it is right there. You want me to operate? You know, it's cancerous. Do you want me to operate? Of course I want you to operate. That's the same thing here, friend. God puts his finger on the area of your life that's wrong. He puts his finger on it. And you say, Jesus, I'm coming down to that altar. I'm going to operate. This pastor over here shared about television. You want to know the first thing I gave up after God touched my life? I'd never watched bad programs, but I'd watch the news. And I'd watch two hours of the news. I'd watch several different channels, make sure I got the news. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, stay away. Don't read a magazine, a newspaper, or watch television. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. And I found out, I found out that by doing that, when something important happens, like the Oklahoma City bombing, I knew about that bombing before most everyone in this room did. If it's important, God will get the news to you. People will call. They'll say, Steve, did you hear about this? Or, you know, one of my staff members will come to me and say, this is going on with Bill Clinton, something this, something that. But I don't have to sit in front of that television set and soak myself with all that junk. If you had not obeyed God, would that have been sin, Steve? Absolutely. That would have been sin. But it's not pornography. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's a time waster. Do you believe you need to destroy the television set? No, you'll never hear me say that. I believe God can use the television set. I believe there's some great videos for your kids to watch. There's some good programs. But some of you are just, you're addicts. You're addicted to it. And God's going to break that bondage. You're going to be free from it. Here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to come in just a minute and sing Mercy Seat. Everyone in this room that has sin in your life, you're doing things that normally you would never do. You're doing things that you would never do. You've backslidden, and little things don't bother you anymore. You can sit in front of a screen and watch somebody slip their clothes off, and it doesn't grieve you. You can walk through Walmart and look up at the Cosmopolitan cover of the magazine, and, sir, you can stare at it and lust at that woman rather than turn your head quickly. Let me ask you, what do you think Jesus would do? I think he would turn his head. I don't think Jesus would sit there and watch the television program. He just wouldn't. You know better. Do you think he'd be reading the fantasy novels, ma'am? I don't think so. But in a backslidden condition, you'll start doing things that you normally never do. Little things aren't as bad anymore. There's some teenagers. Richard, there's a teenager listening to me right now. You were on fire for God about a year ago. Not in this revival. You're visiting here. 
but someone has come into your life and sucked the very spirit out of you and now you're doing things with that individual that you wouldn't dream of doing. You never dreamed of doing anything like it in your life. But now you're heavy petting, you're necking, and you probably have sex with him or her. You're backslidden, sis. Serious. In serious shape. And in just a minute, you're going to give your chance, you're going to have a chance to come down here and get right with God. God's going to clean up the mess before it gets messier. He's going to clean it up before you end up pregnant, before you end up wrecking somebody's life. He's going to clean it up tonight. Those of you that are religious, you can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. A confirmation certificate won't save you. A certificate of ordination from the assemblies of God hanging behind your desk won't guarantee your way to heaven. It won't save you. Do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your lips? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your lips? Do you think about him? Do you talk about him? Do you sing his praises? Do you worship Jesus? Are you infatuated with Jesus? If you're not, I question your salvation. I pay that man $10 a night. Get 12 tonight, brother. You've done, done well. <laughs> Who are you to question my salvation? Paul said to examine yourself. This tonight could be like a pop quiz in, tent, in school. Remember those? Clear your desk. Remember those? Dear God, you wanted to run. Why? Weren't paying attention. And God right now is saying, clear your desk. And he's saying, I'm going to give you a quiz and we'll see how well you're doing. Some of you, have, you've missed about 60% of them, 70% of them. You're blown it. But God's going to give you a chance to make things right. And I tell you what, friend, in America right now and in European countries, the term Christian, the meaning behind the word Christian is going to change. Here in America, it's a catch-all phrase. But you're going to see over the next few years when a person says they're a Christian, it's going to stand for holiness, righteousness, purity, Infatuation with Jesus. Everyone stand. Those of you at home, I want you to stand also. Those of you with the chairs, move them to the left and the right as quickly as you can. Are you telling me Jesus will forgive me tonight? Yes, I am. You telling me he'll wash my sins away? Yes, I am. What if I've never known the Lord? He'll do the same for you, friend. If you've never known Jesus, he'll wash you clean tonight. He'll make you new. Someone asked me one day, looked at me straight in the eyes, and he said, are you telling me you know God? I said, yeah. Talk to him today. As a matter of fact, just a minute, I'll talk to him. Jesus, this man doesn't think I know you. Yes, friend, we know God. Skeptic, we know God. Not a God, a God. The one who created it all. I talk to him every day. Are you telling me that he answers your prayers? Yep, yep. Miracles. He saved my whole family. He constantly works miracles. He's concerned about every detail of your life. When I first got saved, I would pray for toilet paper. And God would bring me supernaturally toward me. I haven't even had miracles like that, just silly little miracles. He'll do stuff like that for you. Used to have things happen. You know, if I had a $5 uh, need, need, I'd say, Jesus! Oh, God! Because $5 to me was like thousands. 
to others. Five dollars is a big need. And God would always provide. He would answer my prayer, helping my faith to grow. You telling me he can change my life? I'm telling you he can change your life. Are you telling me he'll be personal to me just like he was to you and is to you? Yes, I am. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? It's possible, friend. Get that garbage out of your head. That negative. He'll never touch me. He'll never forgive me. He'll never wash me. There's somebody here that's been in witchcraft a long time and you can't imagine Jesus forgiving you. The Lord would say unto you tonight, sis, the Lord would say unto you tonight, sir, I've seen your involvement. I forgive. Come to me. I will abundantly pardon. I will abundantly pardon. He'll forgive you, friend. I love this night. Something's just happening here tonight. This has just been one of those so far so wonderful nights. You telling me God's going to touch me? I'm going to close with this one. I remember a man who came up to this altar right here cocked his legs, put his arms like this, and looked me in the eyeballs. It was like, try it, preacher. <laughs> right here. Walked up to him, and normally I'll pass you by if you're like that, but this guy looked like fun. <laughs> I said, you want me to pray for you? He goes, yeah. So I touched him on the forehead. Charlie, were you there that night? He was there. We, by the way, we always have witnesses, friend. If it, we don't have an immediate witness, it's on video, okay? This is just, the whole revival's covered. Touched him. He goes, wham! And friend, I don't know if it's humanly possible. I know with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. He jumped back up just like this. Worse than before. <laughs> you want me to pray for you again? He goes, yeah. <laughs> Cocked his legs, folded his arms, laid my hands on his forehead. Wham! Jump back up just like this. <laughs> he was weakening though. <laughs> you want me to pray for you again? Yeah. Prayed for him again. Wham! On the ground, he's going, uh, 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 uh. and I got on my knees and I said, What do you think the Lord's telling you? He said, He wants me to stay down here on the floor. Friend, he was cocked and ready. That was impossible. But see, we're dealing with a, the, the Almighty. We're not dealing with some imp or some, some something out there. We're dealing with the creator of your body. And God looks at that and he just goes, he looks at your legs and he goes, you know, he just sucks the strength out of them. I don't care how big and brawny you are. When they're turned to rubber, you're down. Why would he do something like that? Get the man's attention. The man probably his whole life, everything to do with God, he did that kind of stuff. You know? Always in front of God like that. Prove yourself, God. So God said, okay, Saul of Tarsus. I think I'll just prove myself. Down you go. Eat some dust. How about a blinding light? How about being blind for a few days? How about that? <laughs> How about, let's dramatize this thing. How about some scales falling from your eyes? How about fish scales? That'd be cool. <laughs> Cover them, fish scales. Why did God do that? That's crazy. Why didn't he just blind them? Why scales over his eyes? Acts chapter 9, read it for yourself. 
Why? Because God wanted to. Amen. Thought it would look great in Scripture. <laughs> Stuff for people to skip over, you know. God's in this house, friend. Here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. If you're away from God, if there's sin in your life, you're going to come quickly. If you've never known the Lord, you're going to come quickly. If you're in this place and you're religious, you're religious but you don't know Jesus, that means you can go to church, but you don't know him intimately, you're going to come down here and meet him. The only thing that will keep you back tonight, friend, is pride. That's the only thing that will stop you. Pride will damn your soul. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Pride will say, listen, if I go down there, people are going to see me. Who cares? What if I go down there? What will my wife think? Who cares? What will my husband think? So what? What will my friends think? Friends, who are they? Who are they? The friends I've had over my life, most of them are gone. You ever notice that? They come and go like the wind. So what if your high school buddy's next to you? Is he going to stand with you on judgment day? Did he die on the cross for your sins? Pride's what will keep you back. And don't ever forget this, friend. If you think you're going to stay in that pew and there's some sin in your life and you're going to go back to your hotel or back to your house, you're going to pray about it. People have said that. I'm going to go home and pray about this. Preacher's right. I've got to get this junk out. It's separating. See, Jesus Christ came to take away the sin of the world. You're going to go back to your hotel room, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you ahead of time what's going to happen. You'll shut your door, your hotel, or your home. You'll shut the door. You'll be alone. You can even put on one of Lindell's worship tapes and put the music up full blast and get the presence of God in that place and just worship the Lord. Praise Him. Inhabit. He inhabits the praises. Just fill the place with the praises of God. And then do like this. Jesus! Just a few hours ago at Brownsville, you spoke to my heart about some sin in my life. And here in my bedroom, I want to deal with this. Now I want to get it out. Don't ever forget these words. You will, you will never forget these words, friend. Here's what you're going to hear. My son was beaten for you. My son was publicly mocked. My son was spat upon. My son was cursed. A crown was pressed on his forehead. Blood dripped into his eyes. Stung his eyes. His back was ripped open with a whip that from the nap of his neck to his buttocks, they plowed his back till it was ribbons. My son bore a cross to a place called Golgotha. My son laid on that beam. They stripped him naked. My son was pierced through his hands and his feet. My son was placed on top of Mount Calvary, not behind it, but on top of it, so everyone can behold his nakedness and his pain and suffering. My son went through everything for you so that you might be forgiven, you might be washed, you might be cleansed. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And you couldn't walk 25 feet. You couldn't go down from the balcony at Brownsville because of pride. You couldn't walk down to the altar and get right with me. And my son did all that for you. And you'll hear these scriptures, friend, if you're ashamed of him, He'll be ashamed of you. If you will confess him, he will confess you. That's hard, preacher. Friend, if you don't start submitting to God, it's going to get harder. It's going to get harder. Submit yourself to him. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Charity is going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who's away from God, everyone who needs forgiveness, everyone in this place, you know Jesus Christ is here and he will forgive you. I want you to come right now. If you're away from God, hurry. You need forgiveness. Hurry. Come on. In the balcony right now. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless.
bless you, brother. Come on, let's go. I face the power Hurry. of sin on my own. I did not know of a place I could go. Come on. Where I In the balcony, let's go. with man are possible with God. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you new. Yes, friends, that sin that has got you engulfed, that's got you shackled, that's got you chained, he'll snap those chains. He'll break the bondages off of you if you'll submit. Get on your knees and say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Come on, right now. Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Lord. He'll do it, friend. Come on. Come on. Hurry. 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 Come on, God bless you. God bless you, son. Listen to the Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. But I know where there's a place of mercy for you. Come on. He said that you could come into his presence without fear and to the holy place where his mercy hovers near. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads down. Everyone at the altar. Just